Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Raya Salter. In our show this week, we'll take you to a meeting of HANO, the Hawaii Alliance of Nonprofit Organizations, covering how nonprofits are doing under the new paradigm of the Trump administration. The keynote by Tim Delaney, president of the National Association of Nonprofits, addressed the new risks for nonprofits under this administration. Tim's remarks were entitled, Urgent Threats, What's at Risk for Nonprofits in the New Policy Landscape? Tim Delaney is a lawyer and leader. He applies his expertise in law, government, and the nonprofit sector in his role as president of the National Council of Nonprofits in Washington, and as a resource and advocate for the nonprofit sector. He and the National Council of Nonprofits work to help charitable nonprofits achieve greater impact by identifying emerging trends, engaging in critical policy issues, exchanging proven practices, and advancing their missions through advocacy. Since graduating from Yale and the University of Texas, Tim has helped nonprofits in a variety of ways. Among other things, he has delivered hundreds of keynote presentations to a diverse range of organizations and groups, and has written extensively about public policy issues affecting the nonprofit sector across our country. We know that the 2016 elections altered the faces and philosophies of many policy players in local, state, and federal government. As a result, charitable nonprofits and foundations now face challenges that threaten their work and even their existence. Tim is well positioned to connect the dots and explore how these changes will affect the nonprofit sector and what can be done about it. We know that the Trump administration is making drastic budget cuts all over the landscape and many of them are highly questionable and profoundly damaging. Some cuts are more highly publicized than others. We need to examine the impacts of these cuts on Hawaii, determine how to respond to or counteract them, and otherwise keep our nonprofits and our community going. Tim spoke about these things to the members of Hano at the Pomaikai Ballroom on May 11th. The meeting was very well attended, and his remarks and advice were the centerpiece of the program that day just a slight handful of all the different advocacy groups out there for the chambers of commerce and NFIB and the defense industries and bankers and insurance and attorneys and doctors and more and more and they get to fuel their advocacy they are at the table because they earn profits that they can then reinvest in various advocacy groups to then lift their voices um, they have a major seat at the table. Many people would submit that they own the table. Um, then we have groups uh, on the government sector, on the right-hand side of the screen. We have the National Governors Association. We have an organization that I used to be very active in, the National Association of Attorneys General, otherwise known as NAG. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, can you imagine a, a, a more descript acronym for attorneys general than <laughs> NAG? Um, the Council of State Governors, Lieutenant Governors, Secretaries of State, Mayors, uh, uh, etc. I was active in some of those groups. I saw how they would come together and share information across state lines, and then they could come out with um, more policies. And sometimes that they would come together and say we don't have enough money, how can we go out and get that? And some of the times I heard people say, you can do things uh, against nonprofits, and that's how you can advance some of the things that you're trying to do. And I, I remember thinking at the time, that's so wrong. Um, and so I was looking forward when I was hired in 2008, when Lisa was, to be able to go to D.C. and work with all nonprofits across the country to share what's going across state lines. Uh, because the other sectors are obviously doing that. And I discovered as I was going into D.C. and trying to have these communications that, lo and behold, the nonprofit sector was naked. Uh, and we needed to have at least a tiny fig leaf to cover us up so we could connect the dots across state lines. And that's what we try to do in transforming the National Council of Nonprofits so that we can be connecting the various nonprofits across the country. In addition to our uh, state associations and nonprofit allies, we also have a, a membership group called the State Policy Allies. These are national groups that have state focus in their public policy because that has been our bread and butter in the past. And so uh, the why, um, Girl Scouts, Goodwill, um, United Way, et cetera, have all joined us so that we can then be connecting uh, the policy dots across state lines 
so that we can be lifting our voices together. Our main focus in the past has been at the state level. We could no longer focus primarily at the state level, so we have pivoted to also start looking at the federal level. We have pivoted to do that in part to help inform you at what's happening at the federal level then comes down and hits you just like Dorothy's house came down and hit the, the witch and landed on her. Things are, uh, feels like they're going to be coming down and hitting you. So what we're trying to do is to slow things down up there before they hit you, do some of the translation work so that you can see what's about to happen. While uh, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be saying is negative because of the consequences, I want to please say uh, and reinforce we should not be demonizing our government partners. Um, they are not uh, the Wicked Witch uh, or Flying Monkeys. They are not evil. Um, they are, in fact, good people who care about the communities that we jointly serve. Nonprofits and uh, governments are serving the same constituents and the same communities. We are in this together. Um, that having been said, I normally attend meetings uh, of the state charity officials, uh, and I have to listen to them. Um, say things about us sometimes uh, and now I'm at a table or at the podium and Hugh is sitting out there and he has to take it from me now um, and um, and I'm glad I'm here on your turf to speak the truth about you Hugh uh, <laughs> because um, I need to speak that truth and that truth is you all here in Hawaii are blessed to have uh, one of the most informed, uh, most caring state charity officials uh, in the nation. Hugh does a tremendous job of setting the tone uh, of his colleagues, some of whom um, will uh, go overboard and uh, forget that they're not uh, there in the business of regulating charities in order to stamp us out, but rather they're there as our partners to stop the bad people from doing bad acts. Uh, and Hugh is constantly pulling the teller to help direct his colleagues nationwide to that truth. Uh, and I, I've seen him in action at the national level. Uh, I've actually uh, been able to do a review of the Hawaii Attorney General's office when I was um, in uh, running my Center for Leadership, Ethics, and, and Public Service, having served as the Chief Deputy AG. And I first met him on that trip in 2001. Um, and I've seen from the inside and outside what a terrific job Hugh does. Uh, so thanks, Hugh, for your leadership. Uh, the United States already spends more than all the other, um, the, I think it's the uh, eight or nine largest countries in the world combined on defense. And now we're going to take $54 billion away from um, domestic programs in order to further enhance defense spending. Um, that is a proposal. That is not um, law yet, and you can have a say in that. Um, also, a proposal for massive in infrastructure spending of over a trillion dollars, uh, building the border wall. Um, the estimates uh, had been 15 to 20. They're now starting to come in at 50 to 70 um, billion dollars. Um, massive tax cuts, lost revenue, um, so many uh, trillions of dollars, uh, untold in part because this is the skinny budget and um, hasn't been um, uh, fully formed, and uh, as well as the, uh, the president's new tax uh, outline, uh, which is a one-page document with some large bullets uh, and not a lot of details. Uh, people are not quite sure what all the damage will be in terms of lost revenues. Um, my own personal bugaboo when talking about um, spending priorities is that the federal government is divided into defense spending and non-defense spending. They won't call it what it is, which is domestic. Instead, it's non-defense. And um, the non-defense uh, discretionary means they have discretion of what they're going to do. The non-defense, non-discretionary would be things such as uh, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, but even those, uh, are, there are some threats against them. And so uh, we all need to be careful when we see words such as non-defense discretionary to understand they're talking about the programs that regular Americans depend upon. A survey from last, late last year showed that two-thirds 
two-thirds of Americans could not tell you what the three branches of government are. Now, when uh, our civic education is so poor that we can't identify what the three branches of government are, how is it we can expect people to understand these more advanced basic um, ideas, such as the states receive on average 30.1% of all their revenue from the federal government. So as the federal government is cutting the budget uh, by roughly 10% for domestic spending, uh, that's going to have major consequences on the states. The states um, right now, um, more than half are in deficit mode. They have about seven weeks to catch up by the end of the year, uh, their fiscal year of uh, June 30th, in order to balance their books. Um, we also have more than half the states are projecting deficits for next year. Uh, and um, if the states right now are teetering uh, and the federal government is going to be cutting some of their revenue streams, that means that the states are going to be hurting even more. When the states start hurting on revenue, they in turn stop their uh, revenue share with their uh, local governments, be they counties or cities or towns or school districts, and they in turn suffer. They then stop doing things and expect uh, the lowest part of the food chain, nonprofits and foundations, to then fill the gap. Uh, and uh, our policymakers are not aware of this flow. So we've got to be working with them to educate them uh, as well, uh, because these pains are huge. Another thing we need to be educating people are is um, where the, the revenue comes from for the nonprofit sector as a whole, not individual nonprofits. But very few people seem to be aware that nationwide, the nonprofit sector earns 32.5% uh, of its revenue from government contracts and grants. Um, a third, only 2% comes from foundations. Last Thursday, um, there was a coordinated, uh, ruthless attack on the Johnson Amendment. It was coordinated by the White House and uh, by Congress. There was a committee hearing uh, by uh, two different subcommittees in the House that do not have uh, jurisdiction over this. The bill is not in front of them, but they did it anyway and brought forward uh, people who were um, talking about uh, the repeal of the Johnson Amendment and uh, a parade of horribles uh, that uh, they say is pre preventing uh, church leaders from speaking out on issues of the day. Well, as you just heard, um, you can do all sorts of advocating and can talk about whatever issues you want on the issues of the day without any limitations. Uh, the limitation is when you are actively engaging uh, in supporting or opposing a candidate for public office. Uh, so that's the limit. Um, and then in the White House, the president signed an executive order uh, that is confusing at best. Uh, the White House and others were talking about how this now changed the landscape and everyone can go out uh, and the clergy can start uh, uh, preaching from the pulpit. Well, a lot of the people that, that we are talking with say, I go to church in part to get away from nonpartisanship and I don't want to have my preacher telling me how to vote. Um, and that's coming from a lot of people in the uh, religious community where 99 different religious groups and denominations uh, have signed a petition to Congress saying, don't do this. There is not a single um, denomination that is pushing this agenda of politicizing nonprofits so that the clergy can uh, preach from the pulpit. They can already preach from the pulpit, but they want to electioneer for or against candidates from the pulpit. Um, uh, and so some are, are saying that this was a great change. Others have looked at the actual language and said, this is a, quote, empty nothing burger, uh, that there's nothing there there, uh, and it doesn't change anything, and that it's just a whole lot of fluff, uh, sort of like what the, the government's attorneys were arguing uh, in the sanctuary city uh, or sanctuary jurisdiction matter. Um, the, in the end, they were saying, oh, it, it's really just the president using his bully pulpit. We didn't mean to change anything. And the federal judge said, I'm not buying it. Um, you, uh, I'm, I'm putting the argument in my order just showing how empty it is. Um, 
And so uh, the, the executive order uh, could very well, it, in fact, it already has been challenged in court, uh, and others may be challenging the executive order uh, on so-called religious freedom because it isn't a religious freedom issue. Again, there are three conditions. Right now, everyone in this room probably has a driver's license, and you have entered into a deal with the government that if you, they give you this driver's license, you will follow the rules of the road. You won't do excessive speeding. You won't run over pedestrians. I mean, some basics. Well, and if you do any of those, then the government's going to take your license away. For 501c3s, we have been given this special treatment that we're, we're not taxed and we can receive charitable contributions. But if we um, violate one of those three conditions, then they can take that away. If a preacher wants to endorse candidates from the pulpit, she or he is free to do so. Absolutely. They have a First Amendment right, but then they lose the special uh, 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 permission, the, the special treatment, and they get to pay taxes just like everybody else. Uh, and then they can't receive um, uh, contributions just like anybody else. And so there's a give and take. Uh, so this is not about religious freedom or free speech. This is about trying to weaponize nonprofits and churches uh, for a, a political party and uh, to help uh, politicians and paid political hacks and not really to help the community or nonprofits. The day after his keynote at Hano, Tim appeared at our Think Tech studios for a talk show. He focused on a bill now pending in Congress that would repeal what has been known as the Johnson Amendment to Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. This bill is and should be of great concern to the nonprofit sector and the country. There are people in Congress, I presume they're Republicans, who, are, who would like to see this happen, would like to take the Johnson Amendment off 501c3, which would change the law as you and I have known it for our lifetime. You know. Um, why? Why? What, what, what is the self-interest? What is the motivation? What is their vision for the future on this? Why would they want to peel this off 501c3? Um, what I have read and what I have heard is that there have been a couple of organizations that uh, have been promoting this. Um, their funders want to do this. They see uh, an advantage for particular political interest of theirs uh, to have the freedom to go out and um, take all this additional action. Again, they already have the freedom to do it. They already have the liberty to do it. It's just that um, uh, if they are violating those three conditions, um, they are not to receive the special treatment of being tax exempt uh, and uh, getting the tax deductible contributions. And so. Um, that's where the whole freedom discussion uh, is elusive because they're styling it as though it's freedom of speech and freedom of religion, but not really. But it's not really. It, it's all window dressing, and when you look inside, you see it's not really there, and 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 the consequences could be horrific. Uh, I was presenting to um, the head of, uh, actually the the board of uh, a major U.S. based foundation, uh, and. Um, uh, the, the, the chair um, was talking about how this will change uh, private philanthropy as we know it, uh, were this to pass. They're the foundations uh, and 4,500 other uh, nonprofits across the country have all signed a community letter that you, uh, your nonprofit here, uh, nonprofits uh, on, uh, that are listening across the country can sign um, at www givevoice.org again that's givevoice.org give givevoice.org give thanks to hano and its president lisa maruyama for inviting tim delaney to visit hawaii and for arranging this program and allowing us to attend more recently we caught up with lisa maruyama to discuss hano and nonprofits in hawaii and the background and implications of tim delaney's visit and his remarks at the Hano event. Hano is a support organization for nonprofits in Hawaii. Uh, we provide training, professional development, capacity building services, convening opportunities, networking. We provide research and data on the nonprofit sector, and we're the representative voice for and about the nonprofit sector to our partners in government, business, and the media. Very important, especially now. 
when more falls on the nonprofits than before, especially in this administration, I have to say. Um, now, you have a, a pretty good, a pretty close uh, uh, connection with the National Council of Nonprofits, namely right. Tim Delaney. Can right. you talk about that? Right. Tim is the CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits. We're a member affiliate of the National Council. We're one of 37 state associations of nonprofits around the country. Uh, we also have other affiliate partners. I sit on the board of the National Council. Great. Um, and so we really appreciate the relationship. They provide a lot of um, information and uh, intelligence about what's going on in the, inside the Beltway. And they also, they also have that bird's eye view of the country, really all of the nonprofit communities, and they connect us to each other. And you need to be connected. You need to have a national center on this, don't you? Right, absolutely. It's very important. Um, and um, there's a lot of best practices going on in, in nonprofit communities statewide and uh, nationwide, and we we're able to share those best practices with each other via the National Council of Nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So you arranged a program back a few weeks ago, I guess that was in May, that was a pretty big program uh, here in Hawaii, yeah, we, uh, a HANO program, but you invited Tim Delaney. Can you talk right, about it? Right, right. It was our town hall, and Tim was brought out to kind of a, do a rousing, um, kind of a fomenting of the sector. We really wanted him to give us a practical update on federal uh, budget cut changes, what what the Trump uh, budget might portend and the uh, implications for nonprofits at, the, at, at our level, statewide level, um, in terms of potential cuts. But we also wanted him to help us connect some of the policy dots um, to understand uh, the threats to the, um, a charitable deduction, perhaps, as it's being considered in different federal uh, legislative vehicles. But um, I think most importantly, what was most interesting and alarming for people to hear from Tim on is the Johnson Amendment and the threat or the threat to repeal it completely uh, or even weaken it in some way. And the Johnson Amendment actually was formed to provide nonprofit charitable organizations with the protection to basically be nonpartisan. Yeah. Um, and so Tim will talk, you know, talked at length about some of the threats if we lose the so-called Johnson Amendment and what that would mean for, for our missions. Want to know more about Tim Delaney and the activities and advocacy of the National Council of Nonprofits? Check it out at councilofnonprofits.org. And now let's take a look at our Think Tech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But Think Tech will take you there. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. Think Tech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then, we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you miss a show or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. See our website for links. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech is a high-tech green screen First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to think at thinktechhawaii.com.
Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call in to 415-871-2474 and pose a question or make a comment. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Raya, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Raya does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the health and welfare of our nonprofit sector. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Raya Salter. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.